Notes with Mary Ann. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very empowering show coming right up with special guest Renee Rosen, and she's here to share with us her new book, Park Avenue Summer. Now, wouldn't you like to just read a book that's touted as Mad Men Meets the Devil Wears Prada? This is it. Renee is the best selling author of historical fiction books. Her novels include Windy City Blues, White Collar Girl, What the Lady Wants, and Dollface, as well as her young adult novel, Every Crooked Pot. So let's welcome to the show Renee Rosen. Thank you. What a pleasure it is to have you here. And gosh, you must be so excited. Everyone loves your new book. Oh, thank you. I am very excited to share this story with people. Well, I love what Pop Sugar had to say about your book, Mad Men Meets the Devil Wears Prada, you know, and so why do you think you're getting that type of a response from your book? Um, You know, I think it's a subject that, uh, you know, is just appealing to people. It's light, it's fun. Um, And, you know, given the fact that we're, you know, smack in the middle of the Me Too movement. Um, I just think it's, it's a good time for something like this. Well, why don't you share with our listeners, what inspired you to write this book? So I had been binge watching Mad Men and just sort of fell in love with New York during the sixties. And my previous novels had been set in Chicago and I knew I was ready to make a change and I wanted to set a book in New York. And so I sort of my first uh, instinct was to go to that time period. And I was thinking, well, what's another sort of glamorous industry that I can tap into? And, you know, advertising obviously had been done. And so I started thinking of a magazine. And initially, it was going to be a fictional magazine with all fictional characters. And I was talking with my editor, and it just sort of struck us like, hello, Helen Gurley Brown, Cosmo, it's right there. So uh, that's sort of what led up to it. How long did it take you to do the research for this book? Um, I spent probably, I I tend to sort of start with research, then I start writing, then I go back and research. So it's a little bit of uh, simultaneously, but I would say about a good year. A good year in that. And was there anything that really surprised you when you were doing your research? Well, I got really, really lucky with the research. I uh, was having lunch with a friend of mine, Andrew Gross, uh, and he said, you know, what's your new book about? And as soon as I said Helen Gurley Brown, he and his wife both said, oh my God, we have to introduce you to Lois Cahill. So Lois knew Helen Gurley Brown probably better than anyone else. Lo- um, Lois says that Helen was her, um, like a, a surrogate mother to her. And, uh, So they introduced me to Lois. Lois shared all kinds of stories with me about Helen Gurley Brown. She vetted the book. Um, She made sure, you know, she would say to me, ah, 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 you're starting to sound like Anna Wintour here. And, you know, she would make sure that the language and the approach was true to Helen. So I feel like I got so lucky with that. And some of the stories that she shared with me are things that I was not going to find in any of the other biographies or even the things that Helen had written herself. Well, and for our listeners, why don't you share a little bit about the book? We don't want to give too much away because we want people to pick up their own copy of Park Avenue Summer. You know, we don't do spoilers here. Mm -hmm. Why don't you share a little bit about the book so our listeners get a great idea about it? Sure. So um, because there had been so much already written about Helen Gurley Brown, I wanted to take the story from a slightly different angle. So I started with a young girl, Alice Weiss who uh, leaves her small Midwestern town in Ohio and has this dream of going to New York City and actually becoming a photographer. But instead, she lands this job as Helen Gurley Brown's secretary during the very first days that Helen takes over as editor-in-chief. Now, Helen Gurley Brown had had no prior editorial or magazine experience, so they were both kind of learning as they went. And um, so it's really how um, Alice and Helen Gurley Brown kind of take on Hearst and turn this uh, failing magazine around. And she basically did it in her first issue. You've got to love that. (laughs) Women taking, you know, a bull by the horns and just making, you know, what would be kind of an underdog story really work. 
Yeah. They, they definitely tied both hands behind her back. <laughs> well, you mentioned Hearst and I'd love for you to kind of, ex, you know, kind of expand on that a little bit because I understand the Hearst executives try to really, you know, throw Helen underneath the bus. Yeah. So one thing that I didn't realize, I had always assumed that Helen Gurley Brown started Cosmopolitan magazine, but Cosmopolitan had been around since the 1800s. It actually started out as a very highly esteemed literary magazine. Um, Mark Twain wrote for them, Edith Wharton, Kipling, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And through the years, they kept sort of reinventing the magazine. And by post-World War II, it had become magazine geared for suburban housewives and it was filled with casserole recipes and ways to clean your kitchen floor and not surprisingly subscriptions were just tanking so uh Hearst had actually prepared to fold the magazine until you know enter Helen Gurley Brown and Back in 1962, she had written the scandalous bestseller, Sex and the Single Girl. So she had already sort of become this household name and, you know, sold like 2 million copies within the first month that it was out. And Hearst was terrified that she was going to turn Cosmopolitan into a magazine version of her book, which, of course, is exactly what she did. (laughs) So um, they were constantly trying to rein her in. Um, you know, she had an, a budget that had not been increased since World War II. Uh, everything she wanted to do, they were like, no, 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 you can't do that. That's too risque. Um, so it was really an uphill battle for her. How did she end up overcoming some of these difficulties with Hearst? Because, I mean, it's it's got to have been so difficult. You know, you've got the executives that are saying, hey, you've got a small budget, you know, and just kind of throwing roadblock after roadblock at her. Yeah, I think, you know, they were so conservative and Helen was so out there. I mean, she talked about sex the way other people talked about the weather. And I think it may have been a bit of intimidation on her part that she was able to intimidate them. Um, you know, she she definitely um, led with, she was the velvet hammer. So she had a very soft approach And I think that she just eventually convinced them, like, you got to give me a shot at this. You know, you got nothing to lose. If if it tanks, you you fold up the magazine just like you wanted to. Mm -hmm. It's all on her then, you know? Yeah. Well, she was was just so smart. And her approach was, was, she was very systematic about it. You know, everything's very logical in her mind. Uh, it you know she planned everything out where people are kind of trying to figure out what she's doing there you know yeah she's always two steps ahead of everybody a, a real intelligent savvy businesswoman definitely definitely well you mentioned sex and the single girl where did that idea even come from well now this is funny so it, when she was thirty seven. Helen married David Brown, who was a a very accomplished Hollywood producer. And she had been working as an advertising copywriter. In fact, uh, Mad Men's Peggy Olson was uh, based on Helen Gurley Brown. And it was David Brown who said, Helen, you are the most fascinating single woman I'd ever dated. You should really write a book about being single. And that's where Sex and the Single Girl came from. And, you know, of course, nobody wanted to publish it. It was just, you know, two out there. And uh, they, they did find a publisher. Um, and, you know, all of a sudden, she was a media darling. She was on, you know, TV and radio, even though they wouldn't say the name of the book over the air. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the book's flying off the shelves and people want it. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, my goodness. That is too funny. Well, and I understand that her husband really um, was in, like, really involved in some of the strategy in regards to the magazine. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, before David Brown had gone to Hollywood, he had actually been an editor at Cosmopolitan in one of its various uh, uh, versions. And um, so he knew the industry inside out and backwards. He was the one that got her the job at Hearst. He basically went to Hearst and said, look, you got to give Helen a shot at this. Um, But he was her right-hand man. Um, he wrote a lot of the cover blurbs. Um, he he really sort of, um, he would drop everything 
to to help her. Um, they would always schedule lunch meetings when, you know, when Helen did eat and, mm-hmm. and she went to a lunch meeting, she would make sure that David was lunching in the same restaurant. So just in case she got into trouble, he could come in and, and sort of uh, get her meeting back on track. And what's ironic is, you know, she was a feminist. She was very independent. And yet she really looked to her husband for that kind of support. Well, and I think that really shows, you know, just how, you know, when, when we look at Helen, just how three-dimensional she really is. Because a lot of times when people write about her, it could seem a little two-dimensional. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that was actually a fear that I had um, when I first started doing it. I, it. It was easy to fall into traps that would make her come across as a caricature of herself because she was so larger than life. She, she was so out there. Um, so that was a real challenge for me to make her come across as a full, you know, with all, all her various vulnerabilities and, um, and strengths and all. Well, and I think when people look at strong business women, that's something that they fail to see, you know, it's, we can be vulnerable at the same time and very strong and very powerful in the work that we do. Yeah. And she, you know, she wasn't afraid to, you know, admit when she was scared or, you know, uh, try some stuff. You know, as many times as she was spot on, when she was off, she was really off the mark. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to give too much away, but she had some ideas that maybe weren't so successful. Um, but, uh, you know, she, um, she, she led in a way that made people feel comfortable. I think she made people feel safe. Um, you know, she, she wanted to bring out the very best in the writers that she brought on the photographers. She really wanted people around her to shine. Yeah. Well, and I find it so fascinating that when she authored her, you know, sex and the single girl, just how people were kind of leaving in droves from Cosmo. Oh yeah. They, you know, they're like, I am not going to work for the woman that wrote that book. (laughs) Yeah, not really putting it together that this is probably could be at that time one of the best things that happened for Cosmo. Oh, it's it saved Cosmo and in many ways it saved Hearst, you know, and she pretty much single handedly changed the women's magazine industry. You know, the face of women's magazines were never the same after that first issue hit. Yeah, she really um, just changed the whole narrative there. Yes, definitely. Well, you know, in your book, I mean, and you also kind of talk about this in regards to Helen, she sent a memo to a female staff member. And I'd love for you to kind of share a little bit about that with us. Uh, are, we, are we talking about the, the B memo? Yes. <laughs> so um, one, of, one of Helen's ideas was, um, you know, because she knew sex sells and she was all about, you know, educating her girls because she referred to her readers as her girls. Um, about sex and wanted to, you know, serve all that up to them. And so she issued a memo to her staff, the the female members of her staff, asking them to describe how they would like their breasts treated during lovemaking. And she saw this as, you know, they were going to educate men everywhere on Mm -hmm. how to and how not to. (laughs) And it was a confidential memo that got leaked to Women's Wear Daily. And um, it was one of the few times that got Helen screeching and running through the halls going, there's a viper in the nest. (laughs) Well, and it's interesting. I mean, people look, I mean, we look at our tabloids now and the magazines that we have now, and it wouldn't seem like that's um, really like a, a taboo topic. But at that time, I mean, we're looking at this is the 1960s in New York. I mean, it's a whole different time. And women were, you know, they they weren't really, um, I don't know the best word, but they weren't really open about sex or sexuality. And so it's we're looking at just a different age and how she helped shape the women's movement as well. I, I feel like Helen opened the door on that conversation. Mm-hmm. You know, because like I said, she didn't have the blush gene. I don't think she was capable of blushing, you know, (laughs) talk about sex very matter of factly. And, you know, um, but I think she was one of the first people that really 
got the conversation going. And moving forward, when you were doing your research for this book, was there anything that really kind of surprised you or, you know, something that you thought, gosh, I I need to put this in the book and maybe you just didn't have enough room because I mean, it's, it's very, there's a lot of great information in this book. Yeah, I will share one thing that I could not fit in the book, but um, it's a story that David Brown had told many times. So David Brown um, had basically uh, secured the position of editor-in-chief for Helen with Hearst, and Helen did not feel like she was up for the challenge. And he talks about, he woke up the night before her first day, and she wasn't in bed. And he goes looking around their Park Avenue apartment for her and finds her under the desk in their library, like just hysterical crying, curled up in a fetal position. And she just did not think she was going to be able to do this job. And you know, I, I wish I had found a home for that in the book, but there just wasn't a place to put it in, you know, organically. It would have felt so shoehorned in. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's interesting. I mean, we kind of talked about this a little bit before, but I mean, this is what makes her so three-dimensional and why your book is, in my opinion, so very well written because you get to see these different sides of her. She's just not, you know, someone who's just in there successful, beating the doors down. I mean, she's got got that strong, powerful woman aspect to her, but there's also all these vulnerabilities. Right, right. Yeah, she was, you know, she was a girl's girl. Um, and you know, she, she would make it a point of sort of peppering compliments around. She would, you know, compliment you on your nail polish or your shoes or something, you know, to make you feel good. And, um, you know, but at the same time, she'd slash your copy to bits, you know, (laughs) Um, So it was sort of, you know, on one hand, she really tried to, you know, pump you up, make you feel good. But on the other hand, she was going to get the best out of you. And however she had to do that was how she had to do it. Well, she probably made people, you know, be their best in that regard because it's like, Hey, you, you've got to bring your best game here. Yeah. You know, and Liz Smith who worked at Cosmo for a long, long time um, was so certain that Helen Gurley Brown was going to fire her. And, you know, um, and Helen said, no, 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 we just have to find the right spot for you. And then there were there were stories about Liz Smith walking out of her office with her copy just covered in red ink from Helen's <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, it's It's like heartbreaking at the same time. Well, and, and so as Helen's going through this journey, what are some of the other influencers that really impacted her life and her story? Um, I think Helen... Um, she had lost, she grew up in the Ozarks and her father had died when she, I believe she was 10 years old and just sort of a freak elevator accident. And I think the lack of not having her father, losing him at such a young age, really shaped a lot of her views on men. And, you know, David Brown was, um, I think he was about 10 years older than her, eight years older than her. Um, and so I think that definitely had an impact on her. Her older sister had polio and was bound to a wheelchair. And I think that really uh, weighed on Helen, you know, that she had to support them all. And, you know, a little bit of, you know, why was it Mary? Why not me? Um, but I think one of the biggest drivers in Helen's life absolutely was her relationship with her mother. Hmm. And, Helen, um, Helen really believed that uh, Cleo, that was her mother, Cleo, um, just didn't think she was pretty, you know, um, did not always approve of all the stuff that came flying out of Helen's mouth, especially when, you know, the sex and the single girl, she wasn't, her mother was not really uh, all in favor of that book. Um, so there was a lot of, um, a lot of friction between the two of them. Yeah, they loved each other. But there was a great deal of friction there. And, you know, I think that's what drove Helen into psychoanalysis and just a a lifetime of insecurities about her physical appearance, about her weight, um, you know, all that. I think it started with her mother. 
Well, it's interesting when you look at, you know, just Helen and I mean, there's so many women today that go through those same insecurities, you know, yeah. and it could be from a very, you know, your family members, your, you know, your mom or, you know, very well-meaning teachers or you name it. And so it's interesting how this story is so relatable for so many people. Yeah. And I, I do think that, you know, like, I, I wish I could say that there was a, a female, you know, figure role model in Helen's life as a young girl that sort of set her on this trail of, you know, women's liberation, all that, but it just literally came out of Helen. You know, she just, she was ready to move that forward. huh? <laughs> yeah. And I really, I couldn't find any one piece of, of, you know, what, what jump started that it just, that's just who she became. Well, I understand she also had celebrities that were influencers in her kind of sphere. Well, be, certainly because of David Brown, you know, she knew a lot of uh, big time actors. Like uh, when they made the film version of Sex and the Single Girl, which literally had almost nothing to do with her book other than the title. Um, it was it starred Natalie Wood, Tony Curtis, um, Henry Fonda and Lauren Bacall. And I mean, that's a lot of star power there. And oh, yeah. Hard to believe that those four people could come together and make a truly bad picture, um, but it's we we watched it and it it does not hold up. <laughs> I gotta say, um, but you know, total slapstick and um, uh, but uh, but that put her. You know, she became a celebrity in her own right as a result of that book and then the movie. Um, you know, by the time she went to Cosmo, she was pretty much a household name. And Cosmo was pretty lucky to have her at that time. Absolutely. Th- though they didn't see it that way. <laughs> so I understand one of the celebrities also that had a little influence was Hugh Hefner. Ah, yes, yes. Thank you for, for mentioning that. So Hugh Hefner, um, you know, she kind of had this vision that Cosmo would be the playboy for women. And... Um, so she she really studied Playboy, and um, you know I think that uh, initially when she wanted to start a magazine, they went to Hugh Hefner, um, and it just didn't line up with what he had planned. But she really looked to him as a mentor, and um, I don't want to give too much away, but I have a, a fun scene with uh, Hugh Hefner in the book. Well, and I find it so fascinating because most people when you look at magazines and especially where Cosmo is, you know, you'd be like, well, how, how did Hugh Hefner and, and Helen even, you know, it, it doesn't even seem like they are that well connected, but you can see some, some uh, similarities where they're, you know, one, one's for men, the other one's for women. Right. You know, and Helen, when she did her famous Burt Reynolds nude centerfold, mm-hmm. that was a vision. She had tried to get that going in 1968. And it took her until I believe that, I believe the Burt Reynolds uh, issue came out in 72. And she approached every, she wanted Clint Eastwood. She wanted Robert Redford and Paul Newman and Elliot Gould. And they all said, are you kidding me? No. <laughs> <laughs> And she finally, with enough vodka, got Burt Reynolds to do it. <laughs> years later. Well, but he became very famous for that. <laughs> yeah, he actually wasn't that well known until he did the centerfold. He was just sort of up and coming. Mm-hmm. It's really interesting just how, how things take off in different directions based on, I mean, Helen really had a vision for what she wanted for the, for Cosmo. Oh, Absolutely. And I feel like she edited that magazine as if she were speaking directly to her girls. It was for them. And, you know, she was the queen of exclamation points. And, um, you know, she didn't want any big words. She, she didn't believe in what she called pippy poo copy. <laughs> like she, she fired Rex Reed for writing Pippi Poo copy. <laughs> well, they didn't have to feel like they had to go to a dictionary to understand an article. Um, and, you know, I think that she thought, well, what would these girls want to, you know, want to know most about? What's the one thing they're afraid to ask anyone about that I can provide that information for them? 
And I think it was a very personal, intimate mission that she took on. And, you know, she, she really felt a responsibility to her readers. And, you know, I'd like to kind of just remind our listeners, you know, during the, the, excuse me, the 1960s, there wasn't a whole lot of information for women at that time in regards to like their bodies and, and doing, you know, just kind of exploring women in general. I mean, it was, some of this stuff was really taboo. Oh, absolutely. You know, you didn't talk about it. Um, You know, and there was probably so much misinformation out there you know, what, what little did make it through the, the grapevine. Um, so, you know, again, I, I feel like she really opened, a, a, opened up a very important discussion um, that women were sexual beings. They were allowed to express themselves sexually. They didn't have to be married to do it. Um, you know, it was really groundbla- groundbreaking. Yeah, she really, you know, put the women's movement kind of front and center. And it was something that women could really connect with and be part of. Yeah. And, you know, there were there were other schools of thought during the second wave of feminism. She was certainly one brand of it. Um, and, you know, but I think it was, a you know, people who questioned was she or was she not a feminist? Helen Gurley Brown definitely saw herself as a feminist. And, you know, I, I don't think there's any other way to interpret what she did than liberating women. Maybe it was from a, a sexual angle, but it was still liberating for women. Mm-hmm. Without a doubt. Well, my goodness, Renee, I mean, we could talk forever about your book, but we don't want to give anything away because Park Avenue Summer is a great read. And I know our listeners are going to want to pick up their own copy. Where can people connect with you and be part of your community? Oh, I, I'm all over social media. So, um, you can find me on Facebook, Renee Rosen, author, Twitter, Renee Rosen one, uh, starting to get the hang of Instagram. Um, and, um, you can always email me through my website, which is Renee Rosen.com. Um, I love meeting up with book groups. I Skype in with book groups a lot. So, uh, don't hesitate to ask if that's what, you know, your group is interested in. But, you know, love connecting with readers and and fellow writers and book lovers. Well, Renee, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Renee. It's been such an honor to spend this time with you. And of course, to talk about your new book, Park Avenue Summer. Again, if you'd like to pick up a copy of Park Avenue Summer, you can at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie bookstores. If you'd like to connect with Renee, you can at her website, ReneeRosen.com. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmaryann.com for more information.